Hey Parkview, it's good to be here again virtually. Uh, we're all adjusting and in that adjustment there are things we miss. Things that we're used to doing, things that we're uh, used to experiencing that we just can't do right now. Maybe for you, uh, you really miss going to a certain restaurant and, and sitting and, and being there. Maybe you wish you could go to a baseball game this year. Uh, whatever it is, there are certain things that, that we're used to doing that we can't do right now. Uh, so while that is kind of a bummer, uh, one way to look at it though is Think about how sweet it's going to be when you get to do that thing again. When you get to experience that thing that, that you really miss, uh, how much more will you savor it? Will you enjoy it? Uh, will you appreciate it uh, now having kind of feeling like it's been taken away for a while? Uh, our life's like that in a, lot of, in a lot of ways. I think food is another example where uh, some of the best meals I can think of are not really about what I ate, but more about how hungry I was. Like if I'm really, really hungry and I haven't eaten all day and I've been working all day, that meal is like the best thing ever. And like the hungrier we are, the more we enjoy it. Uh, the Bible talks a lot about that concept, about hu being hungry, being thirsty, and then being satisfied. Uh, so as we go into communion, I, have you ever thought about why do we, why do we take food and drink with communion. Like Jesus wanted us to remember him and what he did for us. Couldn't he have just said, get together and remember me? Why do we have to take something in? And I think it's because of that same idea, because Jesus knew, you know, we, we need to remember how desperate we are, how, how much we need to be filled and need to be satisfied. Here's what it says about that. In Psalm 63, I'm going to read the first five verses. It says, O oh God, you are my God, Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied, as with rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. So as we take communion today, uh, let's remember, uh, as we remember how much we miss certain things in our life, uh, how much, just like being hungry for those things or hungry for a meal, uh, we are in need of, of God's love to, um, to fill our lives and, and to satisfy us. So let's, let's, let's pray. God, we thank you that you are the one that satisfies us, and I pray that we would recognize uh, how desperately we need you. We need your love, we need your grace, we need your forgiveness. Uh, we thank you for uh, being present and, and being the one who, um, who always satisfies the needs that we have. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, and as we go into a time of prayer and offering, I'm going to pray and uh, there will be instructions to give. Thank you so much for your generosity during this time. We appreciate so much how hard uh, the staff and everyone at the church is still working. Uh, so you'll see that on the screen and, and I will pray. 
God, thank you so much uh, that we can still worship, uh, that while things are so different, uh, our relationship with you, our connection with you is still available to us, and we have access to you through your word and through messages and, and through going directly to you. And so I pray that we would do that. pray that as a church, we would continue to be the church in our community, uh, to love you with all of our heart and love our neighbors as ourselves. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Another way you can give is by going to myparkviewchurch.com and clicking on giving. Once you're at the next page, you can choose a fund you'd like to give to and a dollar amount. Then you can choose whether you'd like to give by card or by bank account. And just click submit. Hello Parkview, good to see you. Kind of. Well, you get to see me at least, and that's that's worthwhile. Hey, the virus has really changed things. This is our ninth week uh, doing church online rather than in person. It's changed that. The official name of the virus is the coronavirus 2000, coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19. Kind of like the freshman 15. It, you get 19 extra pounds because your office is right by the refrigerator. Virus has also changed my preaching plan. We've inserted a short series we're doing right now called Let God Be God, trying to focus on the majesty and the greatness of God. Here's the reason. We have great big problems. We need a big God. By the way, it's a reminder through this virus, you're not in control, you never were, and we're reminded of that. Most of us suffer from having too small a view of God. J.D. Greer, and you've heard this quote before, said, we prefer a God we can manage, predict, and control. God is only slightly bigger and a slightly smarter version of us. That's what feels safe to us. So we've been looking at the idea of let God be God. We looked at Job a couple weeks there, and the bottom falls out of Job's life, and God doesn't explain himself, but he does say, you can trust me, and Job learns to trust God. Last week, uh, we looked at the life of Moses, and God said, i got a big job for you. And Moses said, I'm, I'm not enough. And God said, well, I am enough. I am who I am, and he learned to trust God. Today, we're going to look at a tendency we have. It's a bad tendency. When we don't like something about God, we tend to try to reshape him into a more acceptable form. Now, I say we try to reshape God into a more acceptable form. We treat God like he's a, a Build-A-Bear God. Now, I've never been to Build-A-Bear, and I hope never to go. But I've talked to those who have, and I understand you can go there and you pick out the parts for your bear, and not only the parts for your bear, you can pick out all the accessories, and they say it could be a little expensive before you get out of there. But we do that with God. We like, I like this, I don't like this. Kind of like a salad bar. That's something you'll never hear again after the virus is over, salad bar. People say things like, you know, my God would never, he'd never restrict my freedom. Or my Jesus would never punish people who don't obey. Or Jesus, my Jesus would never speak harshly. Or my God would never forgive a person who did such a terrible thing. My God would never let me fail. Let me just say this as sweetly as I can. You don't get your own personal Jesus. You take him as he is or you don't take him at all. This tendency to reshape God into a new image is not new. In fact, God addressed it in the second of the Ten Commandments. It was the first of the commandments that Israel broke. Here's the commandment, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 4. You must not make for yourself an idol or any kind of image of anything in the heavens or the earth or in the sea. Get that idea of image. Don't make another image. Verse 5, you must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. Again, the key word is image. Don't add an image or a shape to God in your mind that he hasn't given to himself. Sometimes we assume this commandment is just a restating in the first commandment, Exodus 23. You must not have any other God but me. The first command talks about worshiping the wrong gods. The second command forbids worshiping the true God, the right God, in the wrong ways. The wrong way is adding something to God, some, some image or attribute that goes contrary to what God has revealed about himself. I, I love what Brian said last week. The Bible is about God. It's not about you. It's not a self-help book. The Bible is about God, and that's his revelation to us. Now, we're tempted to read the second commandment 
Don't make any image uh, of anything else around it. And think, well, at least I haven't done that one. That's a command I'm, I'm pretty good with. But we break this commandment. Think about this. We break this commandment whenever we define God as we want him to be rather than as he actually is. We break the commandment whenever we define God as we want him to be rather than, than as he is. Now, one of the best mockeries of this was done in a movie several years ago that my kids made me watch called Talladega Nights. And the star of the show is Will Ferrell. And they gather around the family uh, lunch table. His wife has all the good things, Taco Bell, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Honey Buns, all the good things she's worked hard on. And asked uh, Will Ferrell to say grace, and Ricky Bobby is the character. And he begins to pray, Dear Baby Jesus. And he does that about five times, and his wife finally says, Come on now, Jesus grew up. He became a man. He talked to the grown-up Jesus. In classic, this line from Will Ferrell says, I like Christmas baby Jesus best. That's who I pray to. Eight pounds, six ounce Jesus, all snugly there in your gold fleece diapers in your crib, and yet omnipotent. The other driver at the table says, I like to picture Jesus in a tuxedo t-shirt because it says, I want to be formal, but I'm here to party because I like to party. And I like my Jesus to party too. Even Hollywood recognizes that picking one part of Jesus, one angle about God, and saying that's how you should see him is ridiculous. The bottom line, it doesn't matter how you, how you like to see God, he is who he said he is. When Moses asked God for his name in the sermon Brian preached last week in Exodus chapter 3, the name of God, he didn't say, well, I'll just be whomever you want me to be. He said, I am the I am that I am. Well, how serious is this business of adding to or taking away from the image of God? Well, the last phrase in Exodus 25, when he said, I'll lay the sin on the children and their children's children, and those who reject me, is what he said. Another version says, those who hate me. Reshaping God is hating him, rejecting him as he is. It's a great insult to him. Real relationships with real people are hard because people often confuse and contradict us. The first years of marriage are difficult. Psychologists say, here's the reason. You date, and when you date, you get to know somebody, a part of them, and you like that part, and then you fill in the gaps of what you don't know with what you want them to be. Then you get marriage, and that married, that image is shattered. Here's the quote, love is a dream, and marriage is like an alarm clock. Well, God is that way as well. You can't just assume things about God or just have him be what you want him to be. He's not always going to be what you want. In fact, he's probably going to offend you. Offend you. He's an equal opportunity offender. He offends everybody. Every culture is offended by Jesus. Here's an example of that. You read John chapter 8, the great story. Uh, Jesus encounters a woman who's been caught in adultery. The Pharisees bring her in. They want him to say to kill her. And Jesus asks them, if you haven't sinned, then you cast the first stone. And one by one, they leave. And we love that story of forgiveness. But you know what? When Muslims hear that story, they're scandalized by the lack of justice. How, what they say is, how in the world can we have any kind of society if adultery is allowed? Jesus should have come down hard on this. On the other hand, we're scandalized because Jesus told the woman, now you go, but don't sin anymore. There is a standard of right and wrong. Well, Exodus chapter 32. This is the story. It's the, the breaking of that commandment of make no image. And it's the, just, here's what happened. Moses is on the mountain, receiving the Ten Commandments, receiving the law from God. Exodus 32.1. When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Now, Aaron is Moses' brother. Come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. Here's the background of that story. In the last month, I'm talking the previous 30 days, God had miraculously delivered Israel from 400 years of slavery in Egypt by plagues that really attacked the Egyptian gods. And then God moved the Egyptians to give the Israelites lovely parting gifts, gave them gold on their way out of town. Then God led them visibly, cloud in the daytime, fire at night to get them where they needed to go. Got down to the Red Sea. They were in a cul-de-sac, and God opened the Red Sea by a miracle. People walked across on dry land, but the Egyptians couldn't follow because God closed the sea back up. Then God gave them miracle bread to eat every day in the wilderness. That's just been the last 30 days. Now, prior to this, that, those 30 days, Moses has been on the mountain for 40 and it's late, he's later coming down than they expected, and suddenly they feel abandoned by God. Well, that's exactly what happens. Chapter 32 and verse 2. So Aaron said, 
Take the gold rings from the ears of your sons, your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. All the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and molded it in the shape of a calf. When the people saw it, they exclaimed, O Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Aaron saw how excited the people were, uh, so he built an altar in front of the calf. Then he announced, Tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. Now notice this. They built a calf, but the festival is to the Lord. And when you see Lord in all caps like it is there in, in verse 5, it's referring to the covenant name of God, the I am that I am, Yahweh, Jehovah, God. And they're not changing gods. They're just worshiping God in a new way. They used a bull to represent the strength of God. That's what they thought they needed at the time. Verse 6, the people got up early the next morning to sacrifice burnt offerings, peace offerings. Those are things that they did in worship that God asked them to do. After this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. Now, that's, we're talking about sexual sin there in a worship service. This is a church service gone wrong. Anytime church ends with the kind of behavior you'd expect only at a college frat party, you got trouble. And God is not happy about it. Chapter 32, verse 7. The Lord told Moses, quick, go down the mountain. Your people whom you brought from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. How quickly they have turned away from the way I commanded them to live. They've melted down gold and made a calf that they've bowed down and sacrificed to it. They're saying, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. It really ticked God off. He's not a fan of being called a cow. And they pictured him as a golden calf. Maybe this will help. Imagine somebody, a friend of yours comes and says, you know, I've always admired your life, but I would like to write a biography of you. And somebody comes and says, hey, Mark, can we write a biography? Well, sure, go ahead. And I read the biography they write. And it talks about me growing up in Belleville and going to Bible college and and Mary and Julie having four nice kids and preaching in a good church and all those nice things. But they add some other little things you didn't know about. They talk about my work as an undercover agent in the FBI uh, buying drugs in, in the evening. They talk about being an, an advisor to different presidents. And I finally go and say, hey, you know, the business about the FBI and being an advisor to presidents, just not true. Why did you write that? And my friend says, well, to be honest with you, your life was a little too boring for a book otherwise. You know what? That, that's offensive. And when the people of God say to God, you know what, we don't like you like you are. We want to picture you as a cow, as a golden calf. Well, God's offended. And he says to Moses, I've had it with these people. I'm going to destroy them. I'll start over with you. But Moses intercedes for the people. In chapter 32, verse 19, Moses and Joshua are coming down. When they came near the camp, Moses saw the calf and the dancing. And he burned with anger. He threw the stone tablets to the ground. That's the autographed copy of the Ten Commandments, smashing them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf they had made and burned it. Then he ground it to powder, threw it in the water, and forced the people to drink it. Finally, he turned to Aaron and demanded, Why do these people do to you, what they do to you, to make you bring such a terrible sin against them? Don't get so upset, my lord, Aaron replied. You yourself know how, how evil these people are. They said to me, Make us gods who will lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So I told them, whoever has gold jewelry, take it off. When they brought it to me, I simply threw it in the fire and out came this calf. That's got to be about the lamest excuse I've ever heard. It, it reminds me of the time of, I took Luke camping when he was about 10 years old and we had a knife with us, of course. And he came walking up to me one day and <clears throat> had a rag wrapped around his thumb. And I said, were you playing with a knife? He said, no, I was just walking along and my thumb started to bleed. Well, that's what Aaron says. I just threw the gold in and out came this calf. It's not really my fault. Three truths about counterfeit gods from this story and as we try to reshape God. The first truth is this. Counterfeit gods reflect our fears. Israel was afraid that God had abandoned them, that Moses wasn't there, so they created an image of strength to take care of them. They felt like they needed more than an invisible God and his promises for protection. Counterfeit gods grow out of our distrust of God, so we reconstruct God in a way that guarantees he'll give us what we need. Here's what I mean. We identify something that we have to have, something we need even more than we need God. And rather than rejecting God, we just reshape God to guarantee he'll give us what we really need. Now, you see the fallacy in there? You don't need anything more than God, but we think we need something more than God, so we reshape God so he'll give us what we think we have to have. For instance, we think, I have to have money, I have to have prosperity to be happy. So we invent a God who guarantees our prosperity. 
And then when the virus hits and the market crashes and jobs are scarce, we wonder, well, where's, where's God? Or we see, <clears throat> we need, we think we need to see ourselves as good people. So we invent a God who is angrier with other people's sins than he is with mine. So you can turn the television on, watch TV preachers, slick bag hair, nice suits, overweight, sweating like a horse, preaching and railing against homosexuality, or a sarcastic preacher like this one, railing against overweight preachers, or homosexual railing against both of us. We want to see ourselves as good, so we think God is angrier with the sins of other people. Or I've known people who really thought the only way for them to be happy was to get out of their present marriage. So they invent a God who's okay with that, even though the Bible is against it. We reshape God to think the way we think. Here are some common ways we do that. We think, you know, if I obey God, then nothing bad's going to happen to me or my family. It, it, it's just, it'll work that way. Or if I tithe, then God will bless me so much that I'll have more than enough to buy all the nice things I wanted to have anyway. Or how about this one? If I'm a faithful preacher, then God will make everybody respect me and like me even though that's the opposite of what happened to Jesus and the preachers in the Bible. And then when God doesn't come through, the one we've invented, we complain that he's not really keeping his promises. Counterfeit gods reflect our fears. Secondly, counterfeit gods corrupt us. This is not some harmless pursuit. Exodus 32, 7, God said to Moses, your people have corrupted themselves. They worship God uh, with this idol, with this calf, for less than a day before they turn to a full-scale orgy. That's a picture of what happens to us when we worship a false god or a remade god. Jeremiah 2.5, they worship worthless idols, only become worthless themselves. The Israelites reduce God down to a single attribute. He's really a balance of all the great attributes. See, he's infinite in love and strength and wisdom. He's strong, he can do what he wants to do. He loves us, he always does the sweet thing, and he does the best thing because he knows what's best, even though it doesn't always make sense to us. See, God is infinitely compassionate and holy. He takes sin seriously, but makes a way for us to get out of it. Spiritual health comes when you see God in his totality, but when you just look at one dimension, it deforms us. So if your view of God is that he's holy and just, but he's not compassionate, you'll be harsh and judgmental, always trying to prove yourself to God. If you look at God and think, man, he's all grace and no righteousness and no holiness and no judgment, you'll call things acceptable that God has already called an abomination. Or if your God isn't fully sovereign, then when trouble comes, you'll panic. If your God is ruler, but he's not beautiful, not satisfying, you'll look after other things and you'll want to go back to sinful things. A distorted view of God leads to a distorted life. Psalm 115. Those who make idols are just like them, as are all who trust in them. Are you worried? What you need is a picture of God as ruler of all. Are you insecure? You need to embrace the promises that God says, I'm enough. Are you harsh and judgmental? You remember the cross. Remember how sinful that you are, that I am. That's how God saved us in the midst of our sin. Are you stingy? Think about the generosity of God that he's given to us. Are you materialistic? Focus on the treasure we possess in Christ. Here's what I'm saying in short. We need worship. We need to focus on God. Even when we can't be together, we need to spend time in worship. That's why adoration needs to be the start of our prayer time. Start with the Psalms, read a Psalm, but think about who God is. A right view of God straightens us out. A wrong view twists us. Counterfeit gods lastly disappoint us. I love the old gospel course that says, he saves, he keeps, he satisfies this wonderful friend of mine. All other gods disappoint. Psalm 16, four, troubles multiply for those who chase after other gods. Jeremiah two, verse 13, my people have done two evil things. They've abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. This is so sad. The trade of the God who, Exodus 19 says, he carried them on eagle's wings. They traded that God for a gold calf they had to carry around. As punishment, Moses ground up the calf and made them drink gold water, and they got sick. The worship of false gods always sickens and never satisfies. Only God is big enough, beautiful enough, good enough to worship. The gods we create, that we create, can never satisfy. You have a choice. You can take God as he is, even though you can't completely understand him. Or you can build a God of your own imagination who has no power and can never help you. Evelyn Underhill said, A God small enough to be understood is not big enough to be worshipped. Let God be God. If you go to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, 
you can see Thomas Jefferson's Bible. Now, Thomas Jefferson loved the words of Jesus, loved his teaching, but he couldn't believe the miracles. He just thought it was too archaic, it didn't strike with the modern man. So he took a knife, just cut out the miracle portions of the Gospels. There's a guy in the Old Testament named Jehoiakim who did the same thing in Jeremiah 36 with the prophecy coming down. He just cut out the things he didn't like. You have to admire the honesty of Jehoiakim and Thomas Jefferson. But if you do that, you end up with a God of your own imagination, a God who can never help you. Here's my charge. Let God be God. Take him as he is, mystery and all. We've got big problems. We desperately need the big God of the Bible. The good news, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, sister, in his hands. Put your trust in him. Let God be God. Thank you for joining our broadcast today. Make sure to check out those announcement slides and we'll see you next week.